please turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 6. Hey, two things before we dive in. One, this coming Wednesday night, we are hosting a live stream lecture with my dear friend, Dr. AJ Swoboda. And um, it's basically on his new book, After Doubt, How to Question Your Faith Without Losing It. It's all on deconstructionism and kind of that zeitgeist of our generation per last week's teaching. And uh, it's open and available to all of you Wednesday night. Is it 6.30, Tyler? 7? Yes. You said yes. Which one? 6.30. 6.30. 6.30, 6.30 this coming Wednesday night online, just like the Sunday live stream. Don't miss it. Secondly, um, drum roll. You ready? We actually need a drum roll for this. We are regathering, K- kind of, sort of, <laughs> almost. So as you know, we are coming up on the one-year anniversary of no gatherings in person as a church, and we're still here by the grace of God. And we're in this funky new phase. The Economist recently called it uh, Corona Normal and made the case that we have to kind of adjust our expectations because it's going to be, you know, at least another year or two before we're not living with the virus in some way. But rates are going down. Our governor just announced a few days ago that by July 1st, all of us over the age of 16 should be available to get the vaccine. So, like, hope is on the horizon. In theory, you never know the future, but... Fingers crossed, or not fingers crossed, hope in Jesus, all of that. So we've been praying, and I know there's a wide range of opinions on this inside our own church body. Some of you think we should have started gathering six months ago. Others of you think we should never gather again, ever. Um, Not really, but wait another, you know, a lot longer. And we have a lot of love and respect for all of you across that spectrum and plan to continue the live stream for a very long time until it's safe for everyone to come back together in person. In the meantime, here's our best shot. So we have a long-term plan and a short-term plan. Long-term plan is to return to three gatherings on a Sunday, two in the morning at 9 and 11 a.m. here at our new building on the east side, and then one in the evening at 6 p.m. downtown at First Baptist, where it all started. And we very much still feel a call to function as agents of healing and renewal and have a lot coming to tell you about in weeks to come about kind of what's our role in the healing and renewal, in particular of the spiritual space that is downtown Portland. So, and then with Bridgetown, full Bridgetown kids at all three gatherings. That's the long-term goal. Short-term is kind of a staggered approach. Step one, on March 14th, two weeks from this morning, which is the one-year anniversary of not gathering, anniversary is not the right word, but of not (laughs) gathering in person, we are moving to two morning gatherings, a live stream at 9 a.m. right here, and then an 11 a.m. live in-person gathering upstairs with masks and full social distancing. So it's a kind of sort of gathering. It is a gathering, but it's not like before or whatever. And then the plan is two weeks after that on Easter Sunday, which is the first weekend in April, to open up Sunday evenings downtown at First Baptist after a lot of pre-work and prayer and stuff like that. And then to kind of inch our way forward over the coming months based on what the virus does and rates in our city and how long it takes to get to herd immunity and all that kind of stuff between kind of now and our future as a church. For Bridgetown kids, it's really tricky because unlike a school, we can't vaccinate all of our teachers and volunteers. And um, the demand is for about 150 volunteers on a Sunday to pull off Bridgetown kids. And in case you don't have children, they're not great at social distancing. It's not like their best thing, if that makes sense. And we don't have a large space to spread them all out. So the plan is to start, God willing, with nursery for those of you that have really little children and then inch our way forward as rates go down, as more of you get the jab and are available to volunteer and serve and please reach out to us. We need your help very bad. In fact, that's a great way. If you have the vaccine and you feel safe, that could be a great way for you to serve over the next three to six months. Families, we know it is hard for you where you're at. We love you. We pray for you. Hang in there. There is an end in sight. So 
That's kind of the plan, and um, again, this is just a very small step forward two weeks from today. For more information and to register, you can go to bridgetown.church slash regather. And in the meantime, maybe you're months away yet from coming to an in-person gathering. Maybe, and not necessarily, the next step for you is just to kind of open up your bubble a little bit and gather with a few other people on Sunday morning for the live stream. The people that I know that are actually thriving in this season, um, and a lot of families are doing this, have actually created kind of a quarantine bubble just for church. And they get together on Sunday morning, often parents like break out with you know each Sunday who's watching the children, and then they watch church together, worship together, and then share a meal together, pray for each other, discuss the thing, you know, and do ministry time, and it's really beautiful. So you might not be ready for that, but maybe that feels safe to you and right and fitting as a next step in this season as we move forward as a church. There it is. Um, Bibles, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as we continue our teaching series on future church. Up on the docket for today is a community of holiness and a culture of moral relativism. And we stand for the reading of scripture. God, we open to you right now. As we breathe in and out, we remember that you are closer than the breath. And we welcome you into the deepest part of our being, God. I invite you, church, any place in your body or your spirit or your mind where you are closed off to God, where there's a shallowness of breath, a tightness of chest, a defense mechanism, a wall, an obstruction. I invite you just to open that to God and his loving presence and healing wisdom. God, wherever we are closed, we just open to you. We surrender and yield, heart wide open. We are your disciples, Jesus. You are our master. More than that, in the language of the New Testament and of you yourself, Jesus, we are your servants and you are our master. And we're happy about that because of your love. So we open to you and yield and surrender. And now as we receive the text that we are about to read, receive it not just as an excerpt from an ancient Greco-Roman letter, but as the love and the wisdom of God. Plant it like a seed in the soil of our being, God, and let it grow and bear fruit. Let us turn us as a church into a tree that is full of flourishing right in the soil of our city. Come, Holy Spirit, and do the work. Silence the voice of the enemy. Wall off this room, every apartment, living room, home, kitchen table that people are watching from. Wall us off, guard us and protect us. Fill us with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12 to 20. I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but... I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. 
By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, quote, the two will become one flesh, end quote. But whoever is united with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Take a seat. In 1981, the Harvard political scientist Samuel Huntington wrote a book called American Politics, where he said that every 60 years, America goes through what he called a moral convulsion. You have the American Revolution in the 1760s and 70s. You have Andrew Jackson and the backlash from the South in the 1820s and 30s that brought about the Civil War. You have the Progressive Era in the 1890s and 1900s, and then, of course, the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s and 70s. And every moral convulsion, he said, is marked by a few common denominators. There is a widespread sense of moral decline and disarray, There's a lot of distrust in institutions in general and leaders in particular, a lot of contempt for elites and those in power. A new generation comes along with a a new moral zeal and fervor to make the world a better place. And as they come into power, they change the moral topography of the nation, but after a period of conflict and turmoil. And Huntington predicted in 1981 that the next moral convulsion would hit right around the year 2020. We are living through a moral convulsion. And in a bizarre twist, America is becoming both more moral and more immoral at the same time. More moral in a number of areas, but in particular what comes to mind is human rights, The reckoning of last summer was a long time coming. It started for a lot of our generation uh, a few years ago in 2014 with the killings of Eric Gardner and Michael Brown. But for our nation, of course, it started 400 years ago. It was long overdue. But we're also becoming less moral at the same time. Pick your metric. Infidelity is way up. Lying right now is off the charts. Even cruelty to animals at a statistical level is on the rise. But of course, the main things that come to mind are the sexual revolution on the left and the colossal breakdown of integrity on the right. The only way to make sense of the kind of more moral and at the same time more immoral phenomenon is moral relativism. Now, moral relativism, as we Portlanders know, comes from intellectuals like Michel Foucault and Jacques Derrida, the founder of deconstructionism, It's an odd mix of Darwinian materialism and kind of French postmodernism and Marxist power analysis. Darwinian materialism, all we mean by that is the idea that there is no creator and creation, no uh, sacred order, order in the language of sociology to align your mind and your body to, no design or intent in the universe from a loving and wise creator God that created you for relationships of love and harmony with him and one another and each and your own body and the earth itself, just survival of the fittest and the propagation of our species. Or as Malcolm put it, life finds a way. The basic idea, of course, of postmodernism is that there are no absolutes, which of course is an absolute, hence the rub. Or as Tim Keller put it in a tweet just a few weeks ago, Obi-Wan says, only the Sith deal in absolutes. Since that is an absolute, does that mean he has turned to the dark side? I'm just saying, just had to throw in a little Star Wars and Tim Keller to break up the other stuff. But under a power analysis, it's even worse. Not only is all morality a social construct, you know, for the propagation of the species, 
but truth itself is a form of power used and abused by social groups, in particular by elites and religious leaders to oppress other social groups, in particular those on the margins. Now, of course, this is vintage Foucault. He really, more than any other human being, as I understand it, was responsible for the translation of Marx's power analysis from economy and class to morality as a whole. I was chatting very random with a journalist from The Economist a few days ago. He was doing a piece right now on the future of the American church after the Capitol riots. And we got to talking about Foucault, as you do. And um, he called Foucault the ghost at the banquet of the modern world. Foucault, if you know anything about his history, it's worth your time. He died of AIDS in 1984 in that tragic era of pain and the epidemic. He spent his last years going around San Francisco practicing very violent, I mean literally bloody, sadomasochistic sex. Most likely, we don't know for sure, but most likely intentionally giving AIDS to dozens of his partners and writing essays about how the ideal way to die would be by group orgy suicide, because in his mind, that was the ultimate example of freedom from the oppression of truth. And by the way, he also thought there should be no age of consent for sex between adults and children. I was shocked, and that's saying something for a longtime Portlander, when just before COVID, my son and T and I took a tour of Lincoln High School as we're gearing up for our oldest boy to enter high school. And at Lincoln, if you've been there, it's built in a square, double layer. On each of the eight hallway laws, uh, hallways, were a kind of matching far-left postmodern gender theory poster with um, common slogans like men can have periods too and gender is between the ears, not the legs. And then next to it, literally on the wall of the high school, was one quote from one philosopher from Foucault on every single wall. Education is spiritual formation, for better or for worse. And our children are being intentionally educated into this worldview, and it is very much a worldview. The problem is that moral relativism is the first step toward a kind of moral anarchy, as each person is free to decide good and evil for themselves, which, of course, in the story that we live by right here is a story that goes far Back, back far earlier than the 1960s and French intellectuals to the Garden of Eden itself, where the primal temptation in the story to Adam and to Eve is to redefine good and evil based on the desire in their heart and the voice in their head rather than on what God said was good and evil in order to seize autonomy from God and to become your own God. Like, this is the primal temptation underneath all of the other temptations for every generation, for every culture, for every ethnicity, and so on. Many people, the result of this kind of moral anarchy at an external level when you read the news is the culture wars and the kind of political, tribal you know, violence in a, at a literal level now. At an internal level, a lot closer to home, is an epidemic of anxiety and depression and mental health. There is so much pain and suffering across our generation. Most people in the West, on both the left and the right now, and an increasing number of young Christians, in particular in cities like ours, live by a moral code that simplified basically says, follow your heart, your inner kind of intuitions, feelings, and desires will tell you right from wrong and guide you to a happy life with the one caveat of, quote, as long as it doesn't harm anybody. Now, the pro this is like moral relativism at a you know, slogan level of you do you or be true to yourself or follow your heart or whatever. The problem with follow your heart is it assumes that your heart is an accurate barometer to the good life, that it's trustworthy, not that it is a mixed bag of good desires, but also evil one of goodness and image of God and of the ruin of Satan's sin and death, that it's not full of contradictory and complex desires that live in an odd kind of heart hierarchy and ecosystem, that it's not warped not only by sin and the enemy, but easily manipulated by advertising and politicians and social media. And the problem with as long as it doesn't harm anybody, which sounds great 
at first. The problem is that harm requires the knowledge of good and evil, as does love. To love someone by Jesus' definition of love, which is not tolerance, he would never define love that way, um, though he was very kind, and it's not kindness per se, and it's not definitely not feeling nice, warm, fuzzy emotions. Jesus' definition of love, he said, greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends, or even to love your enemy. For Jesus, to love is to will the good of another ahead of yourself no matter the cost to yourself. The problem is that to love, to will the good of another, requires the knowledge of what is good for them. Easy case study in postmodern ethics. If one of my three wonderful children came to me and said, Dad, I want to do heroin, even my farthest left secular friends, whom I adore, would all say, you say, absolutely not, no way, because we agree that hard drugs are bad for children and adults, just to clarify. Um, <laughs> but what if one of them came to me and said, Dad, I think I'm a girl in a boy's body. Or Dad, I want to have sex with my boyfriend. Or Dad, I want to smoke pot. All of my college roommate friends are doing it. What do I do as a dad? How do I love them? Because that's the goal, right? And not harm them. Well, the problem is, in order to love them or harm them, I need knowledge of good and evil. I need knowledge of what is good for them. Our new building was recently tagged with the slogan, Love is Love, which is a common slogan in town and a fascinating case study in postmodern ethics. But again, the problem is love, harm, hate, all require a transcendent source of moral authority, which is exactly what the West does not have. 300 years of the best secular thought, and this is not me, this is most people would say this, has utterly failed to produce a transcendent moral authority. Many scientists do not even believe right now in free will and argue we're just synapses firing in response to our environment. Science cannot tell us what is, or how, I'm sorry, it can't tell us what is, it cannot tell us how to live, nor can it give us a basis for human rights. Leading experts warn that we are heading toward a human rights crisis because secularism has no metaphysical grounding. Yuval Harari, one of the leading atheists of our day, the author of Sapiens, has called human rights a, quote, Christian myth. Now, I'm not saying that the secular passion for human rights is bad. I share it. I'm saying it's just not intellectually, it's intellectually incongruent. You don't get from we evolve from apes by killing off the weak in a tribal war for dominance to Black Lives Matter. You get to racial justice from Genesis chapter 1. All human beings are created in the image of God, full stop. We are the first society in the history of the world to attempt to live with no sacred order or transcendent moral authority beyond the self, which is the new kind of not sacred, but secular locus point of authority. In a previous era, it was thought fitting to never deny God. In our era, it is thought fitting to never deny yourself. The social fragmentation and emotional epidemic of anxiety and rage are likely signs that our attempts to create utopia apart from God or even a society of equality and justice and happiness apart from God are unlikely to succeed. Now, rant over. Please hear me. I'm not angry. I'm not mad. I come to you in love, in a spirit of love and humility. I'm not harping on anyone here, nor do I or pretty much any of us in the room feel like the church, in America at least, is a shining beacon right now of moral beauty. Like, I don't feel like I can hold up the church and say, see, look at our better way. My point is that while moral relativism is all around us, we are not moral relativists. I just make that crystal clear. We are followers of Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we follow his mental maps to reality as they come to us through the four gospels and the writings of the New Testament and scripture as a whole. That is our transcendent moral authority. It comes to us through scripture. 
and the life and teachings of Jesus, but it is based on the inner life of the Trinity itself, on the inner nature of God. That is our sacred order and our transcendent moral authority. And the more that we align our life to the teachings of Jesus, to his mental maps to reality as they come to us through scripture, the more we flourish and thrive and live in freedom and harmony with relationship to God and one another and even our own self as we live under his rule or his reign or in Jesus' language, in the kingdom. The word for this in scripture is holiness. Now I know that holiness is not only out of date, as a word, but it comes with a lot of baggage for some of you, right? All I do is say the word and you feel fear or oh no, we're becoming, or you feel shame, but it is too important of a word to abandon. Other words I'm happy to abandon, not this one. One of the most repeated commands in all of scripture is be holy as I, the Lord your God, am holy. This is the inner axis of discipleship and spiritual formation. The end goal of the spiritual journey is what ancient Christians called in Greek theosis, from the Greek word theo, meaning God. It translates into English as either deification, or that's a a little too Hindu sounding for some of us in the West, as godliness is another way to translate it, or God-likeness is another way to say it. That's the end goal, be with Jesus, become like Jesus. The end goal of the spiritual journey is as we move into union with the Trinitarian community through prayer, that we are transformed by the spirit and the truth of God, and we become theosis, we become deified, we become like God himself. The word holy is hagia in the original language of the New Testament, and it literally means unique or special or different, or it can also be translated, true story, weird. It means that we live in a weird way, or really just the best meaning is just different. We live different from society as a whole, in money, in sex, in power, in all sorts of things. In a theological sense, the word holy means to be set apart for and dedicated to God. So this is very important. It is not just a moral word. It is a word of consecration. For example, in the Torah, you have holy pots and holy pans at the temple. They aren't holy because they are moral as opposed to all of those like really immoral pots and pans that have Teflon and stuff like that on them. That was an off-the-cuff joke. That was kind of, sort of smart. I had nothing. No love at all. They are holy in that they were set apart for and dedicated for use at the temple and the temple alone. And that made this pot not better than another pot, but it made it holy. It made it different. We are human beings who are dedicated to and set apart for God's presence. Holiness is not just about our behavior but it is about the inner life. Richard Foster said it so well. Holiness is not rules and regulations. All external legalisms fail to capture the heart of holy living and holy dying. Holiness is sustained attention to the heart, the source of all action. It concerns itself with the core of the personality, the wellspring of behavior, the quintessence of the soul. It focuses upon the formation and transformation of this center. Some argue that holiness is about wholeness. It is about integrating your whole person, mind and body, around its center in God. Take a look with me at 1 Corinthians 6 again. I want you to see in this excerpt right here what Pope John Paul II called a theology of the body because it is beautiful and compelling. Again, verse 12, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. Notice that the first line is in quotes meaning the Corinthians were saying to Paul, hey, I have the right to do anything. I'm free in Christ. God is a God of love. Like, it's all good. Paul was saying back to the Corinthians, 
okay, sure, but not everything is good for you. In fact, if you give in to some of your desires, yes, they are authentic to yourself, but they will become a kind of slave master over you. Call that compulsion or addiction or what Paul later calls the tyranny of sin. 13, you say food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. Meaning that was a saying, that was a slogan, like all of the slogans in our city, that was a slogan on the streets of first century Corinth. Food for the stomach, stomach for food, God will destroy them both. Background here, Corinth was just south of Athens by about 50 miles where Plato's influence was still very strong. Plato and a number of other Greek philosophers taught that there is a spiritual world and a material one, that the spiritual was good and eternal, the material was evil and temporary, and he called the body the prison house of the soul. And he said that your soul, which he defined not as your whole person, as it is in biblical theology, but as your inner essence, is the, quote, real you. Does any of this sound familiar? The Corinthians, like most Greeks of the day, therefore concluded, hey, it doesn't really matter then what I do with my body. It's just a thing, right? The real me is on the inside. My body's desire for sex is no different than my body's desire for food or drink or to take a nap. It's just another bodily urge. As we would say, what's the big deal? Listen to Paul's reply, second half of 13. The body, however, notice, not the soul, the body, however, is not meant for, was not created and designed for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and the idea here is in a body, and he will raise us also. Resurrection is not floating up to heaven in a cartoon spirit. It's the coming of your body back to life. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? That was common practice in Corinth, part of the worship of the, of the city. Never do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said, quote from Genesis 2, the two will become one flesh. But whoever is united with the Lord, who is one flesh with the Lord, is one with him in spirit. Three points here. One, the body is not meant for sexual immorality. The word here is porneia, where we get the word pornography. It was basically a miscellaneous word in first century Greek usage for any and all sex outside of marriage and the Judeo-Christian vision of human sexuality. Rather, it's meant for the Lord, meaning we were created for God. This is where Catholics tend to be way ahead of Protestants in theology of sex. A good Catholic theologian would say that Our sex drive is about far more than our body's desire for an orgasm. It is about our soul's desire for communion and contribution. To experience intimacy and generativity. And not even marriage, a good Catholic theologian, at least of the Augustinian variety would say, not even marriage can satisfy that ache in full. As Carl Rayner, that brilliant Catholic theologian said, in this life, all of our symphonies remain unfinished. Only life with God can satisfy that deep ache, which is why there's such a long-running tradition, in particular of Catholic Christians, giving up sexuality and marriage in order to fully give their whole life over to God in prayer. Right or wrong, the heart behind it, and even the theology behind it is beautiful. Two, Jesus came back from the dead in a body, not as a disembodied spirit. And as followers of Jesus, one day we will too. Our relationship to God will take place in our body forever. If that does not validate the wholeness of your person, I don't know what will. Our body matters because it is the, it's not just meat, it's not just the shell, it is the locus point of our relationship with God. And three, Paul is saying that sex is not just a biological act. It is not just play for grown-ups. It is the fusion of two souls. And Paul's language is straight out of Genesis, to become one flesh. Verse 18, he goes on to say, as a result of that theology of the body, flee from sexual immorality, 
Run for your life, scholars argue. This is most likely a quote from a well-known rabbinic midrash on the story of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. If you can imagine that imagery of him dropping his coat, literally, and running in the opposite direction, that is to be our relationship toward all forms of porneia. We just run in the opposite direction. We don't cozy up, we don't flirt, we don't compromise, we don't downplay, we, we follow Joseph, we follow Jesus, we run. 18, second half, all other sins, this is really heavy, I know, but just stay with me. A person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. There's fascinating new scientific research on this, on the chemicals released out of your body in, in an orgasm and how your re- neuroreceptors actually dull the more partners you have. is really interesting new science on this. But set all of that aside, this is key. As my pastor used to say growing up, he was famous for one-liners, like back in the day, he would say, sin isn't bad because it's forbidden, it's forbidden because it's bad. Because it offers you life and freedom, what it actually gives is slavery and death. It's really interesting, you know, we're doing this series along with our dear friends at Reality San Francisco. And so right now, literally as my mom, I wrote this whole teaching with my dear friend Dave Lomas, and he's giving this teaching right now in the Castro District in San Francisco. Same text, same, same teaching. And we were thinking, it was really interesting, we both woke up this morning early, and we were texting at like 5 something a.m., and we both had added a quote right after this line from our childhood pastors, and we realized we had to go all the way back to like the late 80s, 90s for a memory of a pastor who was openly talking about sin. 18C, do you not know that your bodies, this is the best part, your bodies, bodies, your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received as a gift from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were loved. You were paid for by death. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Notice what a high view of the body Paul has and of human sexuality. It's really easy to miss that due to the sex-obsessed nature of our secular culture where sex is basically a religion. I mean, people literally get their identity and sense of self and meaning and purpose from sexuality. It's like a soteriology, a thing that people look to for salvation. More and more, the greatest sin is to still believe in sin, and what people feel they need saving from is the idea that they need saving. This is the world we're living in. And because in some circles of the church, and for sure down through church history, there is a kind of warped view of sex is dirty and bad, save it for the one you love. Whether that was medieval masochism of of a, a monk in need of a really good therapist in the ancient Europe, or more recently, and some of the the shadow side to purity culture in the 80s and 90s. Because of those two extremes, it's easy to miss, this is very key, that scripture's view of the body and human sexuality is higher than that of our secular culture, not lower. This is why Jesus' vision of human sexuality won over the entire Roman Empire and changed the moral nature of the West for almost 2,000 years. It was like a bomb went off. Tim Keller says it so well. The Christian sex ethic was revolutionary. It introduced the very idea of consent in sex, and it made sex not about self-fulfillment, which always privileges those with more power, but about creating lasting community that reflects God's relationship to us. This is a higher, not lower view of sex. Modern culture's sexual logic that sex is for self-fulfillment and self-realization ultimately depersonalizes and objectifies because it ultimately turns sex into a consumer good rather than as a means to nurture a bond of covenant. It leads to fractured community and the decline of marriage and the family. Sex outside of marriage is ultimately transactional, and so it cannot finally be intimate. And not only does it deracinate intimacy in relationships, 
but the body itself. Former lesbian and atheist turned Catholic writer and intellectual, Melinda Selms, in her book, Sexual Authenticity, which is excellent, writes so beautifully, underneath the pop and fizzle of sexological enthusiasm lies a fundamental despair. Not necessarily about life itself, but about the body. This seems counterintuitive. Surely the sexual revolution is about the celebration of the body over and against the pretense that love ends below your neck. Yet beneath all the pageantry of free sex and self-love, there is a fundamental belief that the body doesn't mean anything, that it is insignificant in a literal sense, signifying nothing. You can do anything that you like with it. You can pleasure it with a vacuum cleaner or get a drunken stranger in an alleyway to whip it, or you can give it away to anyone for any reason. It's just a sort of wet machine, a tool that you can use and exchange for whatever purpose suits your fancy. In order to believe this, you must either accept A, that your body is not you, it's just a shell or a juicy robot that the real you, the disembodied ghost, controls, or B, that there's no such thing as human value or dignity. It's just a nice pretense that we make because we are terrified of this senseless and nihilistic universe. Ironically, Christianity, which has always been accused of putting God before man, stands alone amongst a host of modern philosophies declaring that man is a unified, complete being composed of both a mind with a free will and a body, all of which has dignity and meaning. A unified, complete being with dignity dignity, free will, and meaning. Not just that, but in Paul's mind, the temple of the Holy Spirit. This is the crux of the passage. The temple in Jewish theology was the place of overlap between heaven and earth, and it was designed as a model or a microcosm of God's throne room in heaven, It was the place on earth where God would rule Israel from. Now, under the new covenant, with the coming of the Holy Spirit, in the wake of Jesus' death and resurrection, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not brick and mortar, your body that you are in right now. Our body is the place of overlap between heaven and earth and the place of God's presence and rule, and our call as followers of Jesus is to attune to the presence of God in our very body and to let him rule and reign over us so that our bodies become the place where God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And just as the temple was always designed to spread the rule and the reign and the kingdom of God out to the four corners of the earth, our body, and the same metaphor is used for the body of the church by Paul later in in Corinthians, same letter, is designed to spread the loving rule and reign of God out to every single room we enter. Hence the closing line, honor God with your bodies. Not just with your mouth, not just with your mind, not just with your theology, with your bodies. Sexuality is one telling example. It's at the top of Paul's list of how we do this. Nancy Piercy, whom The Economist called America's preeminent Protestant female intellectual, In her stunning book, Love Thy Body, which if you want a doozy of a read, it's excellent. She writes, what Christians do with their sexuality is one of the most important testimonies they give to the surrounding world. Sexuality from the first century to the 21st, from ancient Rome to modern Portland, has always been one of the areas where we are most different from the world. As as well as one of the areas where we pray, and we fall short of this on a regular basis, where we function as a counterculture and attempt to offer the world a compelling vision of an alternative way to be human and sexual. For us, this would mean becoming a community where men and women refrain from sex before marriage, where men, husbands, and wives are faithful to the covenant of marriage, not the contract, until death do us part where men and women seek a marriage partner not on the basis of looks and wealth and privilege, but character, where the unmarried, whether divorced, widowed, or never married, are incorporated as extended family members, having close friendships with both sexes and nurturing relationships with children, 
where people with same-sex attraction, or if you prefer, who are gay or lesbian, are valued members and are given support for their calling to chastity. And where people who struggle with issues of sex and gender identity are welcomed and listened to with humility, patience, and love. We could nuance each bullet point there for an hour, so please interpret what I just said in a gracious way. That is just my attempt to sketch out the basic contours of a community of sexual holiness, a community that is honoring God with our body. It sounds heretical. That sound, what I just said, I'm terrified to stand up and give this teaching. Why? At a church? That sounds heretical to our Portland ears because in a bizarre twist, the Christian moral, let me rephrase, Jesus' moral vision of human sexuality is immoral in the eyes of our city and in most of our peers. When I was growing up, it was just kind of weird. Like, it was just, like, I'm old enough that I, I've, I'm lived, I've done that shift. Like, I remember it was just really weird that I did not have sex with my girlfriend. Now, it's bad. It's evil. It's oppression. It's a repression. It's a threat to our happiness. Paul in Romans 1 writes about how the first sign of a culture that is turned away from God and let go of the creator-creation duality is that the body in general and sensuality in particular become the new locus point of worship. The obsession is then with sex, with food, with hedonism, with image, with appearance, and with power. The body is cut off from God and therefore from the creator's loving design and union, what it was actually created for, and it then becomes just a vehicle for pleasure and performance rather than a temple to receive the loving presence of the Holy Spirit. But while Paul's example in both Romans 1 and here in Corinthians 6 is sexuality, his theology of the body is much broader. We are to honor God with our body bodies as a whole with who we sleep with yes but also with food with money with power with speech with our thought life with justice with our social group relationships with our relationships and inter with our fam all with our fidelity with all of our life now to shift gears how in the world are we to do this i mean talk about swimming upstream in our city Is there a practice from the way of Jesus and our rule of life to index us away from the moral relativism and the the full-blown worship of sensuality in general of our day and toward holiness, to make our bodies more and more a temple of the Holy Spirit, a place of overlap where God's presence is close, where we experience his love and his joy and his peace, and where we live for his pleasure and under his loving rule. Yes, there are many, but at the top of that list is fasting. Now, a few words. Fasting, um, to define it, is just when you go without food for a period of time to give your whole self more fully over to God. Note, go without food. A lot of people, um, and, and no shame here at all, but a lot of people confuse fasting with abstinence, and you hear people say things like, I'm fasting from Instagram right now, or I'm fasting from TV, or I'm fasting from wine. All of that is great. Abstinence has a long tradition in the way of Jesus. We're in Lent, which is a great example, but fasting is a whole body psychosomatic practice that is very hard for us Westerners to get our heads around precisely because it has little to do with our heads. It's a, it's a way of saying yes, it's a way of consent to Jesus' work in your soul and your spiritual formation, not through your intellect, but through your stomach. Like we're used to like, let me read a book on that or listen to a podcast on that or an attend event on that. We're not used to, let me just not eat for a while on that. Like that's outside of our Cartesian kind of worldview. For over a millennium, for over a millennium and a half, really up until the Enlightenment, fasting was a core practice of apprenticeship to Jesus. When Jesus teaches on spiritual discipline, he only names three, and fasting is one of the three. Most Christians would fast twice a week on Wednesdays and on Fridays from, sun, from waking up until after sundown. Even Lent, believe it or not, was originally a 40-day fast like the Muslim feast of Ramadan, where Christians, or festival, not feast of Ramadan, where Christians would not eat until after sundown for 40 days every single year. 
But with the Enlightenment, it all started to taper out. John Wesley in the 1700s, I found this quote, it's money, said this, I fear there are now thousands of Methodists, so-called, both in England and in Ireland, who following the same bad example have entirely left off fasting, who are so far from fasting twice a week. So up to the 1700s, it was still thought of that if you're any kind of a serious Christian, you fast twice a week. That they do not fast twice in the month. You know who you are. He went on to say, and forgive his, his male language here, the man or the person who never fasts is no more in the way to heaven than the man who never prays. Now, I'm not saying he's right. I'm not here to like add legalism to your life. Um, I'm just saying we've come a long ways in a short period of time to where very few followers of Jesus even fast at all, much less on a regular basis, much less twice a week. And yet we believe this is one of the most important practices for our time. The Spirit of God is always zigging where culture is zagging. So it's always moving in the opposite direction of the gods of our age. So as the movement is towards sensuality and indulgence of the body, the movement of the Spirit is to a greater call, a more radical holiness, a deeper surrender, more fasting, not legalism, but more ache in the body for God. Can you imagine what would happen if our entire church began to fast on a regular weekly basis to give our whole body over to God, to consecrate our literal flesh over to God and say, your will be done in my body as it is. Can you imagine the effect that would have on our church? Even since we've started our new rule of life, all sorts of people across our church are now fasting on a weekly basis, short fast, just until dinner once a week. And just that is transforming my wife, it's transforming my oldest son, it's transforming my best friend, it's transforming multiple people in our leadership team, just that. For those of you that are new to fasting, we do have a teaching series and practice all up if you want to know more, because there's tons here to nuance and tons of what about, there's all of that, is at practicingtheway.org slash fasting if you want more. Let me just summarize it, because you have to get the why behind fasting. We fast for three basic reasons. One, to starve the flesh and feed the spirit. The flesh is language used by the New Testament writers to name not just your body as a whole, but that primal animal part of our body that is run by survival instincts and the desire for pleasure, what scientists call our animal brain. Your flesh in biblical imagery from Genesis 3 on is like a beast within. If you feed it, it grows stronger, but if you starve it, it loses its hold over you. And one of the best ways to starve your flesh is to literally not give your body food. Spiritual masters of the way of Jesus have long noted that both the garden temptation of Adam and Eve and the desert temptation of Jesus had to do with food that is not arbitrary or random. There is a reciprocal relationship between our level of self-discipline with food and our level of self-discipline with sin. As Thomas Kempis said it in one of the most important books in 2,000 years, he said, restrain from gluttony and thou shalt the more easily restrain from all the inclinations of the flesh. In context, he was talking about fasting. The less limits we have on our appetite, the less limits we tend to have on other bodily appetites as well, such as for sex or shopping or gossip or even for violence. One of the first things you notice when you start fasting is that your desire for sin doesn't go away, but it does go down, and your desire for God goes way up. You start to crave prayer, where before you were craving all sorts of other things. It's a way to turn your body from an enemy in the fight to an ally. Second, we fast to amplify our prayers Fasting is a way of praying with your body. Theologian Scott McKnight calls it body talk, or Romans calls it groaning beyond words. It's a way of growing in the power of the Spirit. Much could be said about this, and forgive the lack of nuance, but as much as we hate to admit it, there is a reciprocal relationship between our level of holiness and our level of power in the Spirit. The holier we are, the more power we have access to in the spirit. Fasting is one of many ways to grow in holiness and therefore to grow in power. This is my best take on why Jesus said, this kind comes out only by prayer and fasting, while his disciples could not drive it out and he could. Finally, we fast to stand in solidarity with the poor. This is the fasting of Isaiah 43. 
It's a way to stand in solidarity at a practical level to just take the money that you would have spent on food that day or for that period of time and give it to those with not enough food at all and to stand in solidarity from the inside out, not as a savior from the outside, but as a brother or sister. Our practice for the week up ahead is all up at bridgetown.church slash future. The baseline practice that we invite you, again, everything here is invitational. There's no pressure. There's no like, Gerald does not go around checking on your fasting practice or anything like that. This is just our invitation based on how we think it works really well to follow Jesus in a city like Portland is to move toward fasting once a week for the basic fast, which is just 24-hour time period. So you have dinner one night, and then you fast until a late dinner or sometime after sundown the day after that. Um, We practice fasting on Thursdays as a general rule as a church with a ton of flexibility for your schedule and travel and Oh, travel. Remember when that was a part of our life? It's still in me. Um, And all of that. And uh, that is what we would invite you into, just a weekly practice of just whole life reorientation to God and his love. To end, you know, with all of the practices, but especially with fasting, we must keep that why in mind, the end goal in mind. And to summarize all of that, the end goal is a greater experience of delight God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. The contemplatives have long said that the path to union with God is not complex, it's just hard. It's just silence, prayer, fasting, suffering, love. Just giving yourself more fully, day over week, over month, over year, to God himself for a greater experience of his love and his presence. That's what your body is for. It was literally designed. Your body is a miracle. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. Whether you love your body, which is its own problem, or you, or you don't like it at all, you are deeply loved. Your body, as imperfect as all of our bodies are, was designed by the loving, beautiful mind of the Trinitarian community itself as the temple of the Holy Spirit, as a place for you to draw into, draw your whole self into union with God, to see God and to experience greater and greater with each passing year more of his love and his joy and his peace. Fasting, in spite of all of the misunderstandings of it down through church history, is about joy because it's about union with God. It's about coming to the place where our body is God's temple. Our body is the place where increasingly, little by little, in fits and in starts with all sorts of failings and inconsistencies, our body is becoming the place where Jesus is king, where he rules, where he reigns, where he's close and he's near and there is joy, joy. Joy.